informed and active citizens to the shared national identity. So uh, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Kirby Alvarez, an assistant professor from the UP Department of History, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon's webinar. Okay? So this event is organized by the FEU Public Policy Center. This webinar will feature FEU Public Policy Center trustees Dr. Maria Serena Aidiokno, former chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and Professor Emeritus of the UP Department of History, who will talk about how we teach history to Filipino students and how this is crucial to building a sense of nationhood and encouraging informed and active participation among our young citizens. Okay, so uh, we are uh, live. Uh, uh, we are uh, more than 300. We have more than 300 uh, participants here inside our uh, Zoom meeting, and we are also uh, being live streamed in the FEU Public Policy Center Facebook page and the UP Department of History Facebook page. Okay, so uh, to start our program, may we invite uh, Dr. Michael M. Alba, President of the Far Eastern University, to deliver the opening remarks. Can I, I'd like to check my audio. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, welcome to this FEU Public Policy Center or FPPC Forum entitled Pagundad ng Lipunan, Nakatindig sa Kasaysayan, The Role of Philippine History in Shaping Informed and Active Citizens with a Shared National Identity. This seminar is part of the Philippine History Project of the FPPC, which came about when in October 2019, a few university presidents reached the, the shared observation that many ills of Philippine society possibly have their roots in a deficiency in our school's curriculums, which seemingly do not aspire to develop in our students an adult sense of history and what it means to be Filipino as explicit learning outcomes. To spread the blame around, let me name the school heads in the lexicographic order of their university's names. The alleged guilty parties are Father Marcelo Manintim of Adamson University, Dr. Patricia Lagunda of Baliwag University, Dr. Cristina Padolina of Centro Escolar University, yours truly of FEU, Dr. Francisco Benitez, then president of Philippine Women's University and now congressman, congressman of Negros Occidental, 
Dr. Elizabeth Lahos of the Technological Institute of the Philippines and Dr. Esther Garcia of the University of the East. As these university presidents were neither historians nor history teachers, except for Congressman Benitez, who by then was busy with his work in Congress anyway, I suggested that we invite Dr. Maris Jokno to a brainstorming meeting so that she could help us with our problem. Dr. Diokno was, of course, the obvious go-to person, being Professor Emeritus of History at the University of the Philippines and having been the chair of the National Historical Commission. Fortuitously, since Maris was also a trustee of the FPPC, I could use the Policy Center as my cover so that she wouldn't be able to say no. And the rest is, and to use a history. most appropriate word, history. Maris conceptualized a project in two parts, and the FPPC commissioned her to undertake it. The first phase examined the history textbooks of six of the eight schools I mentioned. One school, which shall not be named, was not able to provide the data requested. Another, which can be named, the Techn Technological Institute of the Philippines, did not have a basic education department. But really, there were more than just six data points because FU, for instance, had FU Diliman, FU Cavite, and FU Roosevelt, which by itself, so Roosevelt by itself, had three campuses. On behalf of the FPPC and without in any way preempting Maris and her team, I promise that we will hold a public forum on the results of this phase soon. The second phase of the project examined how history is taught in the classroom using course resources such as lesson plans and unit learning plans, as well as assessments. It is the findings of this phase that will be presented today. Using a pedagogical framework that is grounded in history, Maris and her team studied lear the learning objectives of the lesson plans their instructional designs and class activities. They also delved into the assessment of student learning from the periodic tests. The project's recommendations are of special interest to us in FU, as well as in the six other schools, because a requirement for participating in the project, given that the FPPC has so far footed the bill, is that the school, the schools have to commit to implementing the project's recommendations. As a final word, let me publicly thank Maris and her team for taking on this challenge amid their other engagements and in the thick of their very busy lives. As I constantly kid her and her team in our meetings, they are really taking on the work of several lifetimes. The objective being to edify, that is, to inform, instruct, and improve in a moral sense our school children and the adult Filipino citizens they will become. So again, welcome to this forum. Thank you for the uh, uh, for giving the opening remarks, President Alba. Without uh, further ado, uh, uh, let us welcome the speaker of our webinar this afternoon former uh, professor emeritus of the UP Department of History and former chairperson of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and a former professor of mine, uh, Dr. Maria Serena I. Diokno. Maris? Hi, salamat Kirby. And uh, thank you, Mike, for, for your generous introduction. Let me thank the trustees of the uh, FEU Public Policy Center. And above all, nagpapasalamat ako sa lahat ng mga kasama natin dito ngayong hapon. So let me, let me share my slides and we can go straight to um, to the results of our study as you can see we th this uh, I'll, I'll walk you i hope not too long uh, through the overview of the project the framework and then our 
analysis of instructional design and class activities, which we got from the instructional plans, the assessment, which was based on the periodic tests, and then the findings and recommendations. So these were our goals. Basically, we focused on only two grade levels, grades five and six. Why? Because that's where Philippine history is taught from the beginning, earliest period until the present. And what we want to know is simply how is history taught and how can the teaching be improved. So ang hiningi namin sa mga teachers ng participating schools sa dalawang baitang na ito, yung kanilang mga instructional plans, periodic exams, class exercises. We also asked them to fill up a questionnaire about their background. Now, because of the pandemic, we were unable to observe the classes while they were being taught and to hold FGDs with the teachers and other similar meetings, which we had hoped would, you know, fill in the, the gaps that might arise. Here's the background of the teacher's profile. Um, most of the social studies teachers do not really have a background in history. Uh, the history courses that they listed, that they had taken up in college, are mostly general education history courses, which are not major. No? This, everybody takes uh, GE history. Uh, none have, as of yet, graduate degrees. Um, the in-service training in history is also um, insufficient. Um, based on the responses in the pro in the uh, questionnaire that we so we distributed, there seems to be a heavy reliance on textbooks as the source of information for the class. And except for two schools, we really didn't find any clear criteria for how the teachers select the textbooks. Uh, President Mike, I think, mentioned that the other segment of this project is an analysis of the grades five and six textbooks. And maybe we can hold another webinar for that once we complete the study. Um, it's also interesting that when we ask the teachers why they think, because they say that students don't seem to have an interest in history, and when we ask why, none of the reasons have to deal with how the subject is taught. Okay. So we saw three kinds of instructional plans that were submitted to us. One is a typical lesson plan, learning objectives, list of resource materials, the learning procedures, step-by-step, -step, the assessment. And uh, the schools, we just coded them as school one, school two, whatever, school three is. The second is a unit plan, which doesn't look so much at the daily, but at, at the uh, unit or semester period, no? All the competencies and activities to be taken up. One school, however, submitted a curriculum map, which we could not use because it, it didn't contain any description of the teaching strategies. It was simply a listing, and many of the competencies there and content were simply taken from the DepEd uh, Araling Panlipunan curriculum. So these are the only two types of instructional plans that, that, that we found useful. As for the topics, we told the teachers who participated, bahala na kayo pumili, you choose the lesson plan you like, and this gives you an idea of the range of topics that, that they uh, submitted. Now, let's move on to the fr uh, framework of this project. We, we start from the premise that there are basically two forms of historical knowledge. One is substantive, the other is strategic. Now, what do we mean by substantive knowledge? This refers to two kinds of constructs. The first order construct, which is the typical who, what, when, where, uh, that deals with facts. Okay, that's a typical first order construct. But historical knowledge is, does not consist only of first order constructs. It also has second order constructs, more of a conceptual nature. Definitions of, of, of concepts that appear in, in the course of history, like civilization, revolution, freedom, democracy, and concepts that are particular to the discipline of history. By structural concepts, we mean such things as continuity and change, progress and decline, cause and effect. And by procedural concepts, we mean uh, such notions as the idea of evidence, the idea of historical context, historical significance, these are procedural concepts that help us undertake the second type of historical knowledge, which is strategic, the how, how to do history, how to think historically, how to find evidence, how to analyze it, how to compare points of view, and, and so on. So this is where we're proceeding from, that, that historical knowledge has two forms of, of, of knowledge. 
the learning model that we applied comes from uh, Van Sledra. It's a very interesting, uh, we, we, we find this very useful because the, the model combines both first and second order knowledge, the, the constructs we spoke about earlier, and the practices, the how to, to do history. So when you want to learn history, you have to have an interaction between factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, that's the first and second order construct, and then practices, how to think historically and you know, compare points of view, compare information and so on. This interaction between the two forms of knowledge produce student understanding, which is assessed. And based on that assessment, feedback is derived so that the learning process can be improved. This is the model that we, we are applying in this study. As an example, we use the idea of chronological reasoning. Now we want to emphasize that chronological reasoning does not mean the memorization of dates, okay? Chronological reasoning is a way of thinking so that you are able to understand the context of an event or the context of, 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 of a person's life, of a very important person's life, events that preceded the main event, succeeding events, causality, the big picture, and, and so on. We, chronological reasoning therefore represents a combination of the two forms of knowledge, a combination of first and second order constructs. Dates might be first order constructs, constructs, causality context, these are second order knowledge, and then strategic knowledge, how to. So this is an example. Now to, to look at, to get a project moving, we started by examining the objective. So ano yung nilalayo ng mga lesson plan? Now, ginamit namin yung revised Bloom's taxonomy. The old one was in 1956, and we, we applied the revised one that was done in 2001. Why did we use this? Normally, when you look at textbooks and learning, you look at measurability, are they specific, relevant, are they achievable, blah, blah. But we did not do that. We chose the Bloom's taxonomy of objectives because we wanted to focus on the hierarchy of competencies in the domain of history. So the lowest, higher, the lowest in the rung is remember. And that's the who, what, when, where. But the upper ones, understand, apply, deal with the second order knowledge. And the highest in the hierarchy deal with the strategic knowledge, how to, how to evaluate evidence, how to evaluate opinions, perspectives, and so on. So this is the, this is the, the uh, framework that we use. And we listed all the objectives that came out in the lesson plans and offhand, it looks good. If you look at the grade five textbooks, you will find that most of the objectives, more than 60%, uh, deal with understand, apply, and analyze. Uh, remember, it's only 14%. And the same with grade six, more than about 69% deal with understand, apply, analyze. Uh, here are examples of what we found. When we saw matalakay, na ipaliliwanag, maulawaan, that's understand. Analyze is masuri, na ihambing, may ugnay. Remember is nakapag-ulat, may isa-isa na tutukoy. So this is how we categorize the objectives. However, in practice, when we looked at the class exercises, the class activities, and especially the periodic exams, we found that in practice, skills that were classified as understand tended to simply be um, to entail memorization. Natatalaka yung epekto, na ilalarawan ng kilusang propaganda. These were listed not as means of arriving at an understanding, but simply as means of enumerating what were the effects or qualities or characteristics of these movements. Um, the same applies to the skill of analysis. It's a broad skill. Ideally, it should be broken down into subcomponents like explain, link, or connect. Uh, you know, be able to generalize, to infer, to conclude. But if the skill does not go beyond, it just stops there. Then it ends up as factual recollection. May isa isa, mabigyan kahulugan, magbigay ng halimbawa, mailahad. And we think that the subcomponents should be sequential so that they always lead to a higher order of thinking. Again, if not, then the end result would simply be factual recollection. Now, we did see some efforts to teach causality and context. 
uh, limbawa, nasusuri ang mga salik o natatalakay ang epekto ng pagbubukas, etc. But again, these could easily be reduced to remembering if they are asked in the periodic tests as merely identification or enumeration test items. Um, some competencies are totally absent or are, are exist, uh, hardly exist, like writing. Uh, the ability to infer, which is a fundamental skill in, in history, the ability to compare and evaluate points of view. We hardly saw any of this in the lesson plans or the tests. And some competencies do not go deep enough and sometimes make careless assumptions in the process. For example, na pag kaisipang kolonyal noon at ngayon. So immediately, the lesson assumes that colonial mentality persists. I think we think the more important thing would have been to ask students what they think. Do they think this is so and why and to give evidence or examples rather than simply assume that to be the situation today. So um, we move on now to the instructional design of the lesson plans. There, there were three types of designs that we found. One is the UBD, understanding by design. I think this was popularized by the Dep Ed uh, years ago. No? The second is a textbook-based design. This was used in one school. And then the third is a very activity-oriented uh, learning design that was used in one school. So let's look quickly at each type. If you look at understanding by design, the key to an enduring understanding rests on the essential questions. Now, these essential questions, in the discipline of history, I emphasize, in the discipline of history, first of all, the question must address historically significant content. In other words, it cannot simply be a question of fact because a question of fact is simply memorized. After they give you the answer, the question is ends. There's, there's nothing left to, to, to process intellectually. No? The essential question must also be open-minded. It must ask students to provide an, a justification, not just an answer. That's why essential question cannot be answerable by simply yes or no. Um, of course, the essential question must be oriented toward higher thinking. So what we want to do, the end result is for students to think in a critical way. Now, these higher order competencies that I am mentioning are not strange to us. They are actually enumerated in the Gabay sa curriculum ng Araling Panipunan produced by the DepEd. And you will see them all enumerated there. So these aren't really new or shouldn't be new to us. Um, uh, the essential question should help students think about and even interrogate, ask about their own beliefs, should provoke thinking, should invite discussion and debate. And an essential question is so, is so important that you can ask it again and again, okay? So what were the questions that we found? Well, we, we, I grouped them into two. The second set of questions below, questions four to six, why study history? Basically, that's the question. Why study history? Kinagmulan, mga pagbabago ng panahon ng Espanyol, hamon sa kasarinlan, etc. These are essential questions. Of course, we're assuming they're also processed as such in the classroom. But on face value, these are essential questions. The other three are not. Masasabi bang estratehiko ang kinaroroonan? Answerable by yes or no, that's not an essential question. Paano nakipaglaban ng mga magigiting na Pilipino para sa kalayaan? That's not an essential question that can be answered by fact. And paano maipamamalas ang mapanuring pagunawa? This is a question for the teacher to answer, ask herself or himself, not the, the student. The second instructional design was textbook-based design, which we found in one school. Basically, it follows almost exactly how the textbook is written, even the outline of the, of the lesson plan. And of course, the limitation here is the tendency towards simple factual recollection. Okay? Um, you are also bound by a single narrative or interpretation. That's the narrative of the textbook. And, and so the tendency is for the the textbook and the teacher, by extension, to be the sole sources of information and the learning becomes uh, uh, more passive. The third design is activity-oriented. Now, this one builds, it offers a range of activities from start until the conclusion of the lesson. 
And we found good advantages here because there's a, a, a very uh, vigorous effort to engage uh, students in the learning process. Maraming mga gawain ang inaalok sa mga estudyante. What the, the only limitation we found is that in certain activities, the instructions were, were very broad and vague. There were no guide questions. So it wasn't clear how this would be processed by the student. And equally important, it wasn't also clear how the teacher would process the student outcomes uh, from these um, activities. Then we returned to the lesson plans and looked at all the class activities, regardless of instructional design. And this is what we found. Now, some of the activities have no clear purpose or process. So take a look at this um, activity here in uh, school six, grade five. So hatiin ang mga estudyante sa limang grupo and then mag-a-assign ng isang paksa sa bawat grupo. Christianismo, reduksyon, sistema ng komienda, bandala, sa forced labor. These are abstract concepts. They're not easily understandable. They have to be explained. But what struck us was that the activity uh, the, asked the students to explain, to present these in through drama or poetry or, or song and dance. So these were our questions. First of all, what about the topic do you want, does the teacher want the groups to, to summarize? Because these topics are broad. Who, who started them? How were they implemented? What was their impact? How did Filipinos react? There's no guide whatsoever. Um, then how do these concepts individually and collectively, you know, how do they come together and what do they represent? And finally, for concepts like this, we think that song and dance would not be an appropriate means of, of explaining, of understanding the concepts in a meaningful way. Other examples, activity about kaisipang kolonyal, magpakita ng larawan ng iba't ibang mga bagay. I suppose this means imported and locally made goods. I just assume this wasn't indicated. And then ask some students to give their reactions. And basically our concern here is, okay, what are the objects? But more important is, so, I mean, not just give the reaction, but also to explain why. Because, you know, kids are so used to like or not like by emoji in Facebook. And we were concerned that if they don't go beyond that, then that's, we will simply reinforce a, a very superficial level of learning. Mga hamon sa kasarinlan. So, the lesson will be started. Magpapakita ng isang larawan to ask and then ask questions. A similar thing, no? neither the picture nor the guide questions are described. So we really had no way of evaluating the effectiveness of an activity like this. Then we found lesson plans that called for video, a lot of video viewing. Uh, there was a video supposedly, I don't know, about encomienda, pantica, a video about nearly everything. We couldn't find the videos because there was no title, there was no source. There was no introduction uh, to the video. There was not even a guide to students on how to analyze the video. And it was not clear what learning outcomes were expected from viewing these um, videos. And then again, we, we found a heavy, maybe an, uh, an unhealthy reliance on the textbook in three or five lesson plans in the school, practically Mm, not much of any input or insight from the teacher. Basically, just a replication of the, of the textbook. So then we moved on to the periodic tests. We looked at the exercises and exams, and we said, do the test questions meet the learning objectives? And equally important, what kinds of historical knowledge do they really test? And what kind of competencies do they sample? So these are our observations. We did find a few tests that sample higher order knowledge, like chronological awareness. This is one example. If you look at the box, I don't know if it's big enough for you to see. It's an improvement because the, the instruction is not to put the date. So you're not supposed to memorize it, but you are supposed to number them in the order in which each event happened. Okay, so for example, uh, the first is Declaration, then the um, mock battle, the Paris Treaty, and, and so on. So the, uh, the idea is that you, are, you have an understanding of the flow of, of um, events. But we think that we will give you an example later in our recommendations of how something like this can still be improved. 
The other example is the one on the right, which is acceptable uh, to examine the, um, the Philippine Rehabilitation Act, which of course includes the trade law in 1946 after the war, and to see, uh, to analyze very clear instruction kung nakabuti o hindi nakabuti ito kanino sa mga Pilipino. So that looks okay. This one is a little bit questionable. Sumulat ng isang refleksyon, okay? Binubuo ng anim na pangusap, so you have a six-sentence essay, but the topics are so broad, okay, that it's not clear what about these topics are the students supposed to write about in six sentences. Or if you look at ang mga naging pangulo ng Pilipinas, we have 11 post-war presidents six, since, uh, well, excluding the present one, and you're to write about them in six sentences. We think that's not uh, practical. No? There are, we also found some questions concerning values uh, related to civic engagement, which are good, like paano mo may sa buhay ang mga natutunan bilang isang mag-aaral, paano mo matutulungan ang ating bansa, mapanatili ang kalayaan, and so on. But there's no indication of how teachers are to assess the the answers. Are the students going to write what they know the teachers want to hear? Or is there room for free play and for discussion and, and debate? The overwhelming majority of the questions are objectives, objective type. Uh, it's typical. Uh, we haven't changed for for five, six, I don't know, decades. So multiple choice, uh, matching type, identification, right or wrong wrong true or false you know it didn't matter which school made the test it was like they were made by the same teacher because they were practically the same across the schools um, only factual knowledge was practically being sampled um, hardly any concepts were were tested nearly all the questions test simple memorization Required answers are mostly short, no space for any kind of explanation or discussion. We, we all know that by grades five and six, students are capable of writing a short essay. Certainly they are capable of that. Um, right or wrong answers are based on the textbook or information from the teacher. So in sum, the highest premium is given to the lowest form of knowledge, which is first order, not even the second order, just plain first order knowledge and the lowest skill, which is factual recollection. I like to, to remind my, my fellow teachers, my, my, my students that memorization is not really a competence in history because I promise them that when they reach my age, they will not remember as well as they used to. I'll give you some examples of what we found. Okay. The typical test of identification, we, are, we found the problem of significance. Here, there's a drawing of a bahikubo, and the student is supposed to identify which ani to name the anito that lives in different parts of the house. Um, I, I could not fill the answer because I don't know, okay, so I would fail this test. But again, the more fundamental question is the problem of significance. What is significant about asking where, which, where, where the anitos are in? the parts of the house. Or another one, again, um, if you look at this question, Tama o Mali, um, it's an interesting series of tests. I'll, I'll, the question is, do they test historically significant content? The whole range talks about Visayan terms. Uh, himuka, Oripun, Oripun, Haop, Oripun, Udip, Kahili, Sayue, we're not sure what the, the point of the, the test was. Malikain um, paraan ng paglalahad. We have a problem here with appropriateness and purpose. We mentioned earlier the presentation through poetry or drama of, of these uh, abstract concepts. We found another one about early legends and how the Philippines was peopled in the, early, in the um, earliest period. And the students were asked to to draw, to draw the legends. A uh, problem of, of accuracy or correctness. Uh, this, these were some test questions. We have questions about number one, ang kaisipang kolonyal ay pakihilig sa mga banyagang produkto. Actually, 
virtually every product we use in this country today is made in China. And we all use them. And I wonder whether that is a reflection of pagkahilig sa mga banyagang produkto. Um, question four, living in another country uh, is a sign of colonial mentality. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of fellow Filipinos who, who work abroad, not really because they want to, but they have to. And then, of course, the fifth item, hihina ang halaga ng piso. We know that foreign exchange, the value of the peso, uh, relies on a, a range of factors. Next, test questions on the whole do not meet the learning objectives. Okay, what do we mean here? Take a look at the learning objectives. On the one hand, okay, it's not just matalakay, but there's also nasusuri, nakabubuo ng conclusion. These are higher order competencies. But look at how they are meant to be um, tested through multiple choice, through tama o mali, through identification. These three types of tests cannot test the higher order skills. Probably they can only test the first, na tatalakay, um, but not higher order skills. The same, mailalahad ang mga pagbabagong pangkultura, ang panahon ng mga Espanyol, dala nila, masuri, and then the last one is major recollection, may isa isa. But look at how the assessment of these learning objectives is to be carried out. Um, magsulat ng uh, the first item on day one, and then iguhit ang damit, then sumulat ng sikat, limang sikat naman lahat, sumulat ng limang sayaw, and then answer that portion of the textbook. So. Again, the higher competence of pagsusuri um, is not going to be tested by these kinds of, of assessment. Probably only mailahad at maisa-isa. So from a historical perspective, we really find an that objective tests have an inherent limitation. What's that? Well, it basically suggests that history is a mere litany of facts, a plain narrative. So, this model goes like this. History starts and ends with facts. And so the only competence you need is memorization. And that's a wrong model of history. An objective test also denies the nature of history as an interpretation of the past, which requires evidence. That's the correct model. That history starts with facts, and then it develops an interpretation based on evidence. So the skills it requires are not really memorization, but entire array of competencies from analyzing evidence, being able to compare, establishing connections, making inferences, forming generalizations based on reliable information. So you might ask, baka naman hindi yan kaya ng grades five and six students. Well, studies in the U.S. of grades five and six students show that they are capable of thinking historically. Uh, 1996 study of Lev, Stick, and Barton students can connect particularities with specific knowledge. Another study, two studies, 1970, 97, 98, that they can examine historical sources. Of course, we do not give them in Spanish. We do not give pages and pages. I'll give you some examples in a while. But these are grade appropriate sources, okay? A 1997 study of Barton that students are capable of empathizing. So of course, the limitation of these studies is that they refer to American students. There's no comparable study of Filipino students. I cannot find it in any journal anywhere. Um, I've asked around and nobody does these kinds of studies. All I can say is surely, surely, even in the absence of studies, Filipino students are capable of more than just memorizing. Okay. So to summarize our overall findings, first, that instructional plans that, that merely list teaching or learning uh, strategies, you know, they, they suggest that there's not enough thought or planning that has gone into the teaching process and the learning process. So we're not too happy with these types of instructional plans. The second is that the overwhelming focus is on first order knowledge, who, what, when, where. Very few procedural concepts and hardly any 
strategic knowledge is stored. Now, what we did find is that teachers are aware that there is a need for higher order skills. How do we know that? Because their lesson plans say so. Their lessons, lesson plans indicate that the students must learn to analyze. They must be able to understand. They must be able to explain and so on. But in practice, as, as evidenced by the exercises, the periodic tests, the skills tend to be reduced to the lowest skill of remembering, which is basically enumerate, identify. Periodic exams are typically of the objective type. Very, we found very few essay questions and some were quite vague. They do not lead to higher level skills at any rate. Um, there are some test items that try to develop higher competencies, very few, but on the whole, higher order skills are neglected. The essential questions in the understanding by design uh, model um, do not totally satisfy the criteria for essential questions in history. The textbook based design is also rather limited, not only in terms of sources of information, but also creativity. And again, the overwhelming emphasis on factual recollection. Some learning activities are vague, while others that try to be innovative don't seem appropriate. Maybe they're introduced in the modules just to break the monotony of students memorizing one fact after another. That seems to be the case. Now, outside of the textbook, learning resources are generally not identified. So this was a little bit disappointing because we wanted to know where students get their information. So it tends to confirm our thinking that probably basically the textbook is the source. And then social studies teachers lack training in history. Uh, the in-service training programs that the teachers listed in the questionnaire that we asked for, they're about any and, and every topic, no direction, no, no purpose. Let's put it that way, they're not purposive. So let's go back to the, the framework we started off with. So on, on, on your left, you will see the hierarchy of competencies. The bottom being remember, and then you go up the hierarchy. But in the classroom on the right, as taught, the lowest becomes the highest and the bulk of the learning. Understand and apply follow to a lesser degree. And the top three competencies are practically neglected. We return to our, our framework, how history is should be learned. And this is what we found from the study that asking and addressing questions about the past as practiced and based on the lesson plans and the tests, they simply entail constructs. But what kind? Just first order knowledge. That's the who, what, when, etc. So what is assessed? Again, just the first order. Now, what happens to the second order knowledge and to the other part of this learning model? Strategic knowledge, how to do history, they don't exist. They don't exist at all. So student understanding is based almost entirely on the recollection of, of first order knowledge. And so we question the kind of understanding that students will develop from this kind of model. It's really a how history is taught in practice. It's not a, a learning model that we would, would recommend. So we see a gap between, on the one hand, the teacher's awareness of the need for higher order knowledge. We know teachers are aware. We see this in the instructional plans. They list down the objectives point by point. But we see a gap between that awareness and the practice of teaching lower order knowledge and skills as seen in the assessments and the class exercises. So this is where we go to our recommendation. This gap we think can be answered by CPD training on historical thinking and pedagogy. That's what we are going, we would like to propose, HTP, historical thinking and pedagogy. Of course, in the long run, this is my baby pet project, 
I really would like to see a reform of social studies teacher education, but that's another topic altogether. So we'll skip that. Let's look at the HTP. We, are, we have in mind, for now, we have in mind, actually we have in mind about six modules, but I'll only present three, just to give you an idea of what, what we have, what we are thinking of. So the first one is determining historical significance. This is fundamental because the teachers seem, or we, we want to remove the tendency for teachers to think that just because it's in the textbook, you can ask it. Anything that appears in the textbook can appear in a multiple choice, true and false test, etc. No, we don't agree. Some things, some facts are more significant than others. So historical significance is a fundamental concept in history. Not every fact needs to be memorized. There are parameters for determining historical significance. So the aim of this module would be to explain what historical significance means, what are the parameters we use. We want to guide teachers in selecting historical, historically significant items in the textbooks and to improve class activities. Our modules are rather practical. Uh, they're oriented, to, we, our outputs are very practical as well. You bring a lesson plan and we, you revise it. You bring a periodic test and you revise it. So this module would run something like this, an initial lecture discussion, what makes a person event or site significant. You know, it's not enough to say it's significant because it's in the textbook, that's wrong. It's significant because it inspires me. Well, it might be important to you, not necessarily historically significant as we define it. The significance change over time. These are the questions that we would think should be discussed. Then we have a workshop. Either you ask the participants to go over a chapter of the textbook and select the most important facts or to bring a lesson plan or a test, maybe better a test and weed out all the historically insignificant items and then replace them with significant items and justify your, your choices. That's, that's one. Another module would be elevating competencies. Again, I will not repeat the two forms of historical knowledge. I've explained that. But what we want to do is to improve the present assessment instruments. We'll just give you an example. I showed you this earlier. And then identify the anitos in different parts. So that's just memorization. From mere memorization, we want to elevate the competence to understanding change and continuity. Change and continuity is a second order form of, of, of knowledge, okay? So how would we do this? Well, we ask a student, paghambingin ang dalawang larawan, isa ng tradisyonal na bahay kubo at isa ng makabagong bahay kubo. And then with these two pictures in mind, then they fill up a chart. Ano yung mga katang katangian ng sinauna at ng makabago in terms of the windows, the bubong, the elevation ng bahay, the materials that are used. So that by means of this exercise, people, the, kid, the students are able to understand what has remained the same and what has, has changed. Another example of elevating competencies. Earlier, I showed you this um, exercise where you write down the flow of events, you number each event according to the order in which it happened, sequence. We're thinking from merely sequencing events, why not ask the students to produce a timeline? Making a historical timeline is it's an, it's a helpful tool in history. And then based on that timeline to, to infer, for example, are the statements below valid? based on the timeline, invalid or no basis, meaning the statement could be true, but there's no basis for it in the events in the, listed in the, in the timeline. So if you ask a question like this, if you notice, okay, this is a, an objective test, yes? But the student has to think, not memorize. The student has to think like a historian. Based on what these events signify, then can we say that Filipinos did not suffer any loss? Of course, that's invalid because you have there yung Labanan Satirat Pass where Gregorio del Pilar uh, was killed and we were routed totally, uh, nearly totally routed. Okay, there was evidence of disunity, valid. 
because you look here at the assassination of Kamataya ni Antonio Luna. I didn't change any of the test items. These were from an existing assessment instrument. If I were to make this, I might select different set of events. But just for the sake of, of the um, CPD training, we work with what you have. So this is what you do. Let's work on it. Let's improve it. Spain recognized the Philippine independence in Kawit. Of course, that's invalid because after June 12, you had the mock battle on August 13 between Spain and the U.S. Muslims joined the revolution. No basis. Okay, there's no basis at all. We can't say it's valid. We can't say it's invalid. Malolo's constitution was the basis of the declaration. Of course not, because the declaration was on June 12. The Malolo's constitution was in January the following year. So we elevate the competence from mere chronological thinking to making inferences. Another one, we found two test items about the same identification, yung manunggul jar. And yung una, ito ay isang tapay, ang sisidlan ng mga yung mga ito, ang nagsilbing burial jar. We're referring to different schools, to the same test item. Okay? But instead of simple identification, why not make the students read the symbols, show the pictures of the jar, ask them to identify, to list lahat ng nakikita nila, tao, bagay, at kilos. Kasama dito yung disenyo sa katawan ng banga. And after they list that, then make them read two sentences. Well, okay, three if you want to be strict about it. Three from a primary source, Father Franciscan Father Juan de Placencia, his account that he wrote in 1589. He died, eventually died in Laguna. He had lived there a long time. So he wrote his whole long, long, long piece in Baron Robertson was a description of, you know, early Filipino beliefs and ways of living. So he explains, ganito ang paraan ng paglilibing. At if you go down, bago ilibing, nagluluksa sila ng apat na araw, pagkatapos nilalagay ang kanyang labi sa bangka na nagsisilbing kabaong o ataul. At ilalagay ito sa ilalim ng balkonahe. So we translated the text. We, we just selected very short sentences. And then based on that, then the students ask, answer the following questions. So what we want to do is for students to be able to conclude that the, that the jar was a burial jar. Of course, the teacher will have to process this because it was a secondary burial jar. Now, if you notice in this exercise, the students were actually exposed to two primary sources, the artifact itself, well, a photograph of the artifact, and an excerpt from Father Placentia's um, writing in 1589. So the last module we want to present is reading a primary source. Now, what's important here is the selection of the grade appropriate primary text. It must be appropriate to the grade. I have seen in lesson plans in Canada and the US of social studies teachers introducing primary sources as early as grade one, as early as grade one. Here, we're talking about grades five and six, okay? But of course, for the teachers, we have to give a background, what's the nature of a primary source, how, how to read it, et cetera, et cetera. And the outcome of this was to produce a lesson plan or an exercise or an assessment using uh, primary source material. So what we have here is the painting of, uh, of uh, Juan Luna, Hispania y Filipina. So you start, you, I'll explain. Here's the, how the lesson might run. Pakilala si Juan Luna. I'm just using the marker here of the Historical Commission, but you can use others. And then, ipakilala ang kanyang obra, um, Espana y Filipinas. So you give a background, and then you ask the students to, to analyze the symbols. Two women, one pointing to some future up the staircase. Parang inaakay niya yung isa. So it analyzing a primary source. This is to be taught during the propaganda, the time of the propaganda movement. I think that would be grade six, na siguro, no? first part of grade six. So I, I want to, to end here and um, end by acknowledging my collaborators in this project, whom I should have introduced in the beginning, forgive me, although they were introduced. Um, Dr. Lorena Kalingasan, Lorena, and uh, uh, Shari, Shari Lukman, who will help me answer your questions. So it's your turn now to 
to work. I did my assignment. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Kirby? Maraming salamat po, uh, Dr. Jokno. Uh, thank you for that uh, very comprehensive and concise uh, uh, lecture on the uh, on your study about the lesson structural plans of various uh, schools who participated in the uh, uh, project. Okay, so uh, may we uh, we have a couple of questions from our uh, Zoom participants and uh, and from our Facebook uh, pages from the FEU Public Policy Center page and the UP History Department page. So an anonymous question. Uh, uh, first one, to what extent uh, is the reliance on quote-unquote objective tests, multiple choice, true or false, due to large class sizes that prevent meaningful one-on-one -on -one engagement and evaluation of uh, essay questions? So that's, that's the first one. Uh, Lorena, Shari, which of you wants to take that? Lorena, I, oh, it's Shari. Thank you, Pastor Kirby. Um, I think that's one of um, the biggest challenges, no, lalong lalo na pagdating sa um, public schools, yung pagkakaroon ng malaking class size. However, um, we would argue, no, that um, it shouldn't really be a hurdle or an obstacle in being able to develop higher order thinking skills. Pwedeng gawan ng paraan, no? So, for instance, in a small class size, um, instead of, uh, in small class sizes, we would give individual activities. We could um, parang tweak such activities in such a way that it would suit a bigger class size by having um, group works, no? Um, at the end of the day, kasi, uh, we also have to look at the way teachers ask questions. Um, um, and the way they ask their questions doesn't really have, um, wouldn't really be uh, um, affected by how big the class size. Um, kayang kayang magtanong ng malalim, no? At um, makabuluhan na tanong kahit malaki ang class size. And I and I think no, our classes in UP would would be a testament to that, no? Wherein we would have lecture classes as big as. Um, those that would fill um, big auditoriums. So, um, nandoon talaga sa paraan ng pagtatano. Um, that's my personal take on it. Yeah, I, I can empathize with the public school teachers given the large class sizes that they handle. However, it should not be a hurdle because, for instance, you can do collaborative answering. So, for, for example, you can have an essay and then a group of students will answer collaboratively. Um, what we want is that we do not stop with asking uh, lower level questions. So we should not end with asking only multiple choice items. Thank you. Actually, there are objective type questions that ask higher order skills evaluating opinions, evaluating points of view. You can frame them in terms of objective. Madaling i-check, pero hindi mag-memorize yung bata. Mag-iisip siya bago niya sagutin. Kayang-kaya yun. Um, dagdagan ko rin yung sinabi ni Ma'am Maris at saka ni Ma'am Lorina. Um, halimbawa, yung sinabi ni Ma'am Lorina, yung collaborative um, activities. One of the activities that I've done in my class no, was... Kasi mahi, alam kong mahirap mag-check, lalong-lalo na kapag essay questions, no? What you could do is to have um, peers, no? Yung kaklase nila, check the works of their classmates. Yun nga lang, you have to guide them through the checking. So you would have to provide a set of criteria, no? Um, that will help the students check the works of their classmates. And then, sabay-sabay um, sa klase, or sa klase pwedeng pag-usapan. Tapos yung sinasabi rin ni Ma'am Maris na... Um, pwedeng um, madaling activity, no? Halimbawa, yung pagtuturo ng historical chronology, for instance, you can have activities wherein you would ask the students to sort um, historical photos based on how old uh, they are, yung age nila, without asking them to memorize the dates. Yung ganung klaseng activity, madali siyang sagutan, no? Madali siyang gawin. But at the same time, you're already developing a higher order um, historical thinking skill. Okay, so maraming salamat po sa, uh, sa inyong response. So uh, another question, this time from uh, uh, President Alba. So how do we know uh, teacher training workshops will make a difference in student outcomes? 
Ah. <laughs> um, so, salamat po sa tanong. Um, there are actually studies that have um, shown that such interventions are effective. I'll give an example that's recent. Na- Nadadaluhan din namin ni Dr. Kalingasan. Um, one, uh, that's one that was um, conducted by the Stanford History Education Group, which is um, led by um, Sam Weinberg. Um, this particular activity or event or, or interve- intervention um, was about civic online reasoning skills. Hindi talaga siya sa history, pero na-touch din naman namin yung topic na history. So ang um, main participants nung workshop na yun or seminar na yun were actually teachers. And I think they did a follow-up study afterwards wherein um, tiningnan nila kung nagkaroon ng pagbabago doon sa paraan ng pagtuturo ng mga teachers at saka doon sa naging... Um, parang natutuhan no ng mga bata and they did see a remarkable improvement no um on one level yung pagtuturo ng mga teachers and on another level doon sa um, historical uh, doon sa knowledge and skills na um nakuha ng mga bata based doon sa improved teaching um strategies ng teachers uh, of course uh, we should also look at the quality of the seminar that the teachers are attending Um, I think we have to realize that uh, not all uh, teacher training programs really has an impact on the way teachers teach because we know that for the sake of getting units, seminars are conducted. So uh, if I would like to sell this program that Mahmaris is proposing, uh, we may ensure that with the one-on-one uh, checking that we will do, we are looking forward that the seminar workshop or the CPD or the HPT that we are proposing hopefully will have an impact on the way that teachers teach history in the future. Can I add uh, something, Kirby? Because the, the, the modules that we have in mind are, are hands-on. They're not the typical mag-attend ka ng three-day conference, sign in. You can tune out habang nagsasalita yung teacher. Total, may, may certificate ka, you get your point. Here, what we have in mind are uh, actual lesson plans that are used in class or actual periodic tests or actual portions of textbooks that are used. And that will be the, 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 um, the object of analysis and the object of improvement. So you start off with product A and you end up with, hopefully, an improved product B. To us, that's the only way you will see an impact. Pero kung pa lecture lecture lang, one, one, one panelist after another, after another, syempre, depende na yan sa interest ng teacher na hindi siya matutulog habang may three-day conference. Pero yung iniisip namin, at siguro pwede kong banggitin dito, uh, Mike, na... We want to propose this type of historical thinking and pedagogy training through the um, FEU Institute of Education because it is an accredited uh, CPD provider. So after this webinar, we really intend to sit down with them and, and work on the process and the mechanism and then what modules we need. Of course, we know in the end it's the PRC that will assign the, the number of points. But what we want to emphasize is that the training will be purposive and hands-on. It will not only be theoretical. There, there will be a product. Ewan ko kung kakayanin natin yung one, one-on-one review, Lorena, baka mamatay tayo. But I think if, if, if teachers work in groups and then produce a collective uh, improved version over the original product A, then that will be something that the learning will take place, therefore, because they will have to strive to produce something that is superior to what they, they started with. If I may just add, no? Sorry, uh, actually, so number one, I guess the audience now realizes why I, I said uh, the work involved will, will cover several lifetimes. Parang Maris and her team will have a lot of work to do to uh, to change the way history is taught in the country. But uh, actually, the, the my suggestion, it, it was not a question, but a suggestion that perhaps the people who are trained, the teachers who are trained, what we can do is to 
used to replicate the studies, Maris, that you cited to measure the outcomes in terms of whether whether the students are uh, have been have, have developed in their critical thinking yes. that that would be the way that we can really measure that you know the 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 workshops are effective because in the end it changes the way the learning outcomes are happening with the students themselves so that and, was my suggestion and mike meron kang binanggit noon na hihiya mo sabihin dito ako na lang magbabanggit meron kang sinabi noon na siguro the 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 best outputs that are produced in the workshops those that are superior you know improvement over the original products that that we start off with then they can be maybe posted online in yes. some kind of what you call yeah. learn commons yeah. yes. and teachers can download them yeah. use them in the class for this particular yes. topic ito ang maaring gamitin yes. and on and on yeah so that's uh, that's the other so, output sana yeah that we we would like for this project to have which is that it becomes a crowdsourcing resource parang the work of history will will involve the work of everyone sana who's teaching history so if we can create a learning commons of history teaching resources uh, and what has been cited in the chat box i think is the for instance the stanford the uh, resources I mean, if we can develop our own and share it across the board with everyone, that should be like lifting the tide, diba, in the teaching of history. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, uh, sa ating mga panelists and thank you to Dr. Uh, Alba. Uh, another question. We have a dozen of questions from our uh, various uh, platforms. So, okay. Let me let me read uh, uh, some of those. Oh, wait, na po. Okay. Uh, humahabang ating chat box. Okay. Uh, okay. From uh, from Mary Ann Losada. So, what are the sources can a Filipino student use in interpreting historical data? It would be good to know this so that we can use document-based questions, much like the one used by Advanced Placement World History Curriculum. So thank you, po. So so uh, uh, more on the the uh, the identifying uh, the specific uh, sources and where uh, can they be downloaded or accessed. Yes. So yeah. The, um, number one. Uh, fortunately, more and more um, primary sources are available online. Fortunately. Now, uh, yung mga nakasulat sa Espanyol talagang kailangan isalin. So, yung mga historiador, katulad ko, yun ang isang trabaho namin. Halimbawa, magtuturo ako ng kurso sa UP next semester, yung parang introduction sa kasaysayan, at meron akong gagamitin mga excerpts ng primary sources na from the Spanish archive, sinasalin ko. Pinapakita ko lang yung original na nakasulat sa isang mahirap na basahin na penmanship <laughs> noong panahon noon, tapos isasalin ko sa Filipino uh, or, or sa English para maintindihan ng mga bata. No? So, pwedeng gawin yon. We can work together. Yeah, that's that's a collaborative um, effort. But many sources are not in Spanish. Okay? There's a whole, uh, there's rich material in Filipino about uh, on the Katipunan. And it's available online. Um, if not, we can get it from the NHCP because I was able to get online copies when I was chairman. And we have them in the NHCP library, all in well, it's not even Filipino, it's Tagalog. So, medyo malalim nga. Kailangan minsan may vocabulario din kasi hindi na ginagamit yung mga salita nung no, uh, panahon yun. Okay, so, yes, we can we can work on the sources. But they need not be the complex sources. Okay, like, the example I showed you kanina, three sentences. That's it. Or a painting. Or a photograph. I, I downloaded this book I'm going to use next, ne this next week in my course. And written in 1898 by a Filipino. But ang ganda ng mga photographs. Beautiful, clear. So I have a section on analyzing photographs as historical evidence. So I download, I, I selected. And then I made exercises showing the photograph. Of course, I have to explain this is how you... Treat it, this is how you should examine it, blah, 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 nasa kurso yun. Then ang exercise, oh, ito yung, ito yung photograph. Compare, contrast, anong nakikita, anong, anong tingin mo, ganyan, ganyan. So, these are things that can be done individually or kung malaki yung class, in a group. 
Pero ang point na uulitin ko yung sinabi kanina ni Lorena, we want to move away from memorization. Yun ang talagang dedicated uh, mission naming tatlo. Na lumayo tayo doon, kailangan ng facts, pero yun ang starting point. Hindi yun ang end point. Ginagamit natin yun bilang ebidensya upang maunawaan natin kung ano ba talaga ang nangyari upang makabuo tayo ng sarili nating pagtingin o interpretasyon tungkol sa isang pangyayari. Yun ang talagang dapat. And we can do that by exposing. There are also um, na, um, not only visuals, but um, film medyo mahirap mga later period na. No? Ewan ko yung mga video na tinutukoy ng teacher sa lesson plan. Wala kaming nakitang video tungkol sa encomienda, reduksyon, gusto sabi ko, kaya, saan kaya ito? But, um, if you're talking American period, marami. Black and white pa, no voice, silent picture, downloadable. So, if you want, when we, one of the things we can do when we offer our CPD is when we teach about the session on using primary sources, one session can be on where to find them. In other words, ipapaliwanag namin sa mga araling panlipunan teacher saan pupunta. Alin sites ang reliable. Kasi may criteria din ng mga historiador uh, when, when, you, when you access a site, you know, some sites are not reliable. As you know, maraming mga peking kinakalat online. No? So, yun ay isang bahagi din siguro ng, ng module uh, ng, uh, sa paggamit ng primaryang sanggunian kung saan pwedeng hanapin, tapos, um, at, you know, yung sinasabing kailangan alam ng Spanish, Blair Robertson is in English, 55 volumes, hindi kayo maubusan ng sources, 55 volumes, you can get it online, free, okay, and you, you don't need the whole chapter, you use three sentences, three, four, that's it, I, I, I remember one I picked from a, a friar, I forget the name, son of, Agustinian Friar. Kinuwento niya yung mga superstition ng mga Pilipino, paniwala sa mga tikbala, mga ganong-ganong. So I, I made my class read it in GE history. And they started to laugh and all. And I say, why? I said, do you still believe in that? And then they started to tell me stories. Mom, I believe in that. Ako, nagkasakit ako dahil dito. Of course, I don't know. But they say, Mom, doon sa amin, ganyan pa. Ano. And I said, okay, ilan niya sinulat ito? O, oh, 17th century. O, oh, anong century na tayo ngayon? nananatili pa yung ganyang mga pani paniwala at pagtingin. So, maraming paraan kung paano gamitin ang, ang leksyon. And it was in English. So, para sa teachers, sa Araling Panipulan, isali na lang natin sa Filipino para madali at maglagay ng bokabularyo kung may mga salitado na hindi masyadong maunawaan ng grade 5 or grade 6 student. No? Tapos, pwede naman tayong mag-simplify. Eh. Sa pagtuturo, pinapayagan tayo. Basta isulat natin doon sa dulo, sa source, kung saan natin nakuha. Tapos sabihin natin, itong uh, pagsali na ito ay modifikasyon ng original. Para, para <laughs> hindi tayo mag-misrepresent ng, ng, ng primary source. No? Pero, pwede, you know, even when I use the Tagalog sources noong 19th century, nire-respell ko na sa modern. Kasi hindi na maintindihan ng estudyante yung spelling noon, mahirapan. So, pwede rin yun. Pati yung Spanish na ginagamit noon, when I transcribe, nire-respell ko na sa modern. Kasi, you know, we have to be practical. And our point is to, to use it as a tool. But also, we, you know, if our kids get exposed to primary sources, history becomes more exciting. It becomes more alive. Because they say, oh my God, ganyan pala. Ay, ganyan palang itsura natin noon. Oh, ganyan pala yung ganun. Hindi siya yung isang abstraction na babasa mo sa isang boring na textbook na walang kabuhay-buhay. Ang textbook, mahusay yan sa pampatulog. Sorry, ah. Unless talagang super duper excellent, madaling matulog pag textbook. Kaya ano yung magpapayaman at magpapagising sa atin? Yung exposure sa iba't ibang mga sanggunian sa kasaysayan. Yan ang, yan ang talagang ex magiging exciting yung kurso. Ha? Sana pagdating nila sa college, hindi na nila hatest subject ang GE history. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Kasi so talagang uh, unfavorite nila. Ano ba yung emoji? Not like. Ano ba yun? <laughs> Ayaw nila talaga. Angry. Okay. So, uh, thank you po doon, ma'am. So, uh, question. Okay, from Aaron from Belgium. So, he, he sent me a message earlier sa, sa Telegram. Sabi niya. Okay. Uh, uh, how do we factor or consider technological innovations? Internet archives, YouTube, online museums, 
especially since the landscape of the education delivery is changing owing to the pandemic in teaching yeah. and learning history. So is there a module in the proposed CPD workshop that will touch on this uh, as well? And related to that, another former, another former student of yours, ma'am, uh, from Isabel Aguilar, sabi niya, who will be in charge of the CPD training for history teachers? Are they also competent in historical thinking skills? Yes, ma'am. Of course, competent. No? Well, first, the, the one, the, 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 the provider will be the FEU Institute of, of Education. But we will do, we will provide, we will, we will do the modules, Lorena, Shari, and I will prepare the modules and we will, we will deliver them. And then we will work. And maybe I can break it down in a, in a more concrete way. Mag-uumpisa tayo sa isang, let's say, uh, synchronous session, kung saan ipaliliwanag namin yung, yung dapat maipaliwanag. Kung tungkol sa paggamit ng primaryang sanggunian or tungkol sa mga internet sources, ng uh, primaryang sanggunian, then that lecture will cover that. And magpapakita ng maraming halimbawa kung paano ginagawa, etc., etc. And then the workshop part will be asynchronous. Doon na maghahati-hati ang mga participants into groups kung saan gagawa sila ng lesson plan gamit na gagamitin ng isa sa mga primaryang sanggunian na ipinakita doon sa, sa, sa lecture. So, bahala sila. How long will it take them? Five hours? Six hours? I don't know. It depends on how many units we can get from the PRC for this. Once they produce that, then we come together again in a synchronous session where uh, these will be presented. Of course, hindi kayang i-present lahat kung malaki ang group board. Sasubmit muna sa amin, then kaming tatlo, pipili kami ng range, no? ng, ng gawa ng mga teachers. And then, yun ang ipapresent ng mga groups. And people will comment. So the learning is both group and individual and then plenary. That's that's how we, we see it. So in answer to your question, Aaron, yes, of course, important yung, yung technological uh, resources. Uh, U.S. Library of Congress is the best for uh, American period. Ang dali-dali magano. And you know, it's they give you aids how to analyze a cartoon. They give you timelines. They explain to you how to use a primary source. The, the U.S. Library of Congress is, is the best. We, I can, we can have in one of the sessions, we can go online and I can actually demonstrate how to use. It's where to click. Ito, makikita ito. Very good. Uh, the Spanish one is um, harder. Di ba, Kirby? Yes. Spanish archive is much more difficult. Bukod sa Spanish, hindi siya kasing technologically advanced with teaching aids as, let's say, the U.S. Library of Congress. U.S. Library of Congress is really geared towards users. So user-friendly. Yes, ma'am. Ang Spanish archive, mm, Ay, no. Yeah, hindi masyado, <laughs> pero kailangan mo talaga siya tsagain. Yeah. Historians, let historians <laughs> like work. Yes, yes. So, another yeah. question. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, medyo problematic kasi hindi available online ang mga documents. At, at least doon sa Spanish, ang napansin ko sa Spanish archives, you'll be impressed, ha? I, I'm impressed. Ang dami ng mga documents that are available online. Of course, they're written in Spanish, handwritten, not transcribed. Pero ang dami na, unlike before. So, it, that, that is to me a marked improvement compared to a decade ago, let's say. Pero sa Philippine archives, wala pang ganon, unfortunately. So, Isabel, in relation to your question, I hope to the uh, me qualified enough, but certainly uh, we'll put up a team of, of qualified um, historians and pedagogical experts. I, I'm not so original here. I have to say I'm really strongly influenced by how the Stanford History Education Group developed. I'm not saying we're trying to be that, but when I look at how they read a lot of their stuff, and really it's, it's fueled by, it's driven by historians, who, who also understand pedagogy and pedagogical experts who also understand history. So, so it's a good blend. Tapos, uh, 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 they address basic education. So it's good. Okay, so thank you, Pudan, ma'am. So another question, I think uh, every member of the project can answer this. Uh, a question from Lorenzo Maria Velasco. Uh, given the importance of teaching better history education to shape the Filipino national identity, is there any chance that there will be significant changes in the K-1280 system wherein history will be taught in higher levels? Meaning, uh, 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 beyond grade 5 and grade 6 na Philippine history, 
uh, I'm concerned about how sustained history education is from grade five to grade eight because there will be students who will eventually forget basic history. Uh, um, so Lori, Elena or Shari, you want to answer that? Uh, you want me to? You. I'll start po muna siguro. Um, I'll respond to that question with this. Um, I think in addition to the number of years Philippine history should be taught and whether it should also be taught in high school, I think it's equally important that we reflect, um, examine, and work on the way history is taught. No? In other words, tingnan at suriin din natin kung paano ba natin ito itinuturo. Because if, let's say, we teach Philippine history in high school again, however, no, we teach it the same way where higher order thinking skills are largely ignored or neglected, I think there would be little to no improvement in our students' historical knowledge and skills. In short, parang para sa akin, mas mainam siguro muna nating tingnan paano ba natin itinuturo ang kasaysayan sa loob ng silid-aralan ngayon. Um, is the entire hierarchy of competencies no, na inilatag ni Ma'am Maris kanina being addressed. Kasi kunwari, extend nga natin, pero ganun pa rin yung pagtuturo. Recall, um, memorization. Then babalik at babalik tayo dun sa dati na very minimal yung natututunan ng bata. Yeah, and uh, historical thinking skills is not naman confined to Philippine history. I mean, you can do historical thinking in Asian history, world history. I mean, pwede pa rin naman siyang ma-apply dun sa mga uh, konteksto ng Asia at uh, kasaysayan ng daigdig. So, Yun nga, sabi ni Teacher Shari, kung uulitin mo ang Philippine history na pareho rin lang yung pagtuturo, eh baka mas maayos na pag-igihan muna natin yung 5 and 6. Diba? Parang if, if Philippine history is taught well in grades 5 and 6, then baka okay siya. Baka okay na siya. Actually, ang, ang, we're, we're approaching this from, from the point of view of of both content, but also the 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 competence, no, which is what I think we're we're trying to to emphasize here. Um, maybe I can relate a little anecdote. It's not an anecdote; it really happened uh, when we were when DepEd was shifting to the K to twelve, and we were asked to help out in the in the writing. So we looked at the grade one textbook, and we wanted to include a student how to how to make a timeline well of course the i was called by the higher ups the usec and the other higher ups at dep ed para ko magdi defend ng thesis um because they heard na wow may may, may timeline ganun grade 1 uh ganyan kay so I, I explained that the timeline can be a timeline of pictures ano yung mga laruan na nilalaro mo nung ikaw ay sanggol Isang buwan, pirated. O ano, nung ikaw ay two years old, ano yung nilalaro mo ngayon? So, it doesn't have, it's a historical timeline, but about a person's life or your your height, your your, your how you, you look, things you can do. Dati hindi ako makalakad o dirated lang. O ngayon, makakatakbo na ako, di pwede na ako mag-basketball. But it can be in a, in a timeline, not in words, grade one, they, they can draw it, they can sketch it. In other words, if we are creative, the, the scaffolding, let's call it that way, the scaffolding for historical thinking, and time is one of the scaffolds, okay? These can be taught as early as grade one. And this is done, this is done abroad. I've seen, the, I've seen their modules. So that when you then they when they transition to to more history type courses, the, the, the skills are are there already there. Oh yeah, okay, we know how we know how this works. We we know how to do this, etc. Ang ang ayo naming mangyari is that sinisensor natin ang sarili natin ng bakak hindi kaya ng bata. Hindi kaya. Bakat hindi natin kaya ng ituro. Ah, yun ang ibang usapan. Kailangan kaya ni natin. No, pagbutihin natin ang ating uh, pagtuturo. Kasi ako naniniwala ko, kung kaya natin ituro, kaya matututo yan ng estudyante, ng bata, kahit maliit. Nakukuha niya yan. Basta alam natin na ang COP, ang pinipili nating paksa, ang COP yung, yung level ng skill. Basta it's scaffolding, building it 
brick by brick, they'll, they'll, they'll get it. So I agree with what Lorena and, and Shari said, no? that kahit na ituro ang history every year, eh, kung ganyan lang ituturo, ewan ko pa, minsan sabi ko, baka lalong ma-turn off ang estudyante. Kasi pagdating sa college, I ask them, oh, I, I don't even ask, oh, how do you feel about history? Ang unang tanong ko is, why do you hate history? And karamihan nagsasabi, ma'am, kasi boring eh. Bakit boring? Eh, ma'am, paano sinuturo? Boring. Yun ang laging sagot. Eh, nagretiro na ako nung nag-upisa itong project. Hindi pa ako retirado. Ngayon, retirado. <laughs> Ganun ang mga sagot sa akin. Kaya talagang, you know, let's, you know, I'm, I, I believe in the Filipino teacher eh. Napaka-creative. Kayang-kaya. That's why we're thinking if we can train, kayang-kayang gawin. And you can, and teachers can produce the, the best resources. Basta may, may tools. Kung kailangan ng primary sources, sige, let historians collaborate with you. We'll, we'll, we'll feed you materials. O ito, try, nyo, try natin ito. Try ito, try yan. Sayang eh. Okay, related, uh, thank you po ma'am. Uh, thank you sa response. Related po doon sa idea ng training or improving uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the ways history or social studies teacher can teach history subjects. A question from uh, Mark Joseph Hawaiian. Given the awareness of, of the importance of teaching historical thinking, what factors do you think impede social studies teachers from focusing more on higher order thinking? Okay, so uh, uh, that's it. Iba may second set of questions, but I think na na kanina. So what, again, what are the factors do you think impede social studies teachers from focusing on more on higher order thinking uh, skills. Um, kayo, Lorena, ikaw, from uh, your experience. They do not know. Um, okay. Kasi, alam mo, ta- ako, kunwari ako, no, social studies teacher ako, my background is economics. So, I, I don't know anything about uh, historical thinking. Ganyan. So, uh, when I was exposed to this historical thinking skills and was able to collaborate and invite Mamaris to the area, parang mas naintindihan ko na siya. So maybe the reason why teachers do not teach historical thinking skills is because they do not know. And the reason why teachers are teaching this way is because this is the way they were taught. Di ba gano'n naman ang kadalasang uh, that's the, the main reason yun lagi yung uh, isinasagot ng mga teachers eh, ma'am nagtuturo kami kung paano kami tinuruan eh, hindi parang hindi uso nun yung historical thinking eh, right? parang hindi siya nababanggit nung ako ay nag-aaral so um, one of the reasons why teachers do not teach historical thinking is kasi nga ang Karamihan, yung, yung question niya is merely awareness of historical thinking skill. So, kailangang alamin mo siya talaga at intindihin mo siya at unawain para mo siya maituro. And I think papasok yung pinresent ni Ma'am Maris kanina regarding the, um, the profile of the teachers that um, were involved in the study. Kung mapapansin po natin, very limited yung exposure nila no um to history as a discipline um if anything it's limited to them studying history as a GE subject so um it also begs the question paano itinuro ang kasaysayan sa kanila sa GE subjects na yun nabigyan ba ng um karampatang pansin ang iba't ibang historical thinking skills were they taught to do no history not just yung content knowledge when it comes to history so malaking factor yung um, yung familiarity at saka yung exposure ng teacher doon sa disiplina ng kasaysayan. See, the, the truth is, that's why I, I agreed to teach in the College of Education graduate school. Because I knew that the, the, the social studies, mga estudyante ko, teacher sa Araling Panlipunan, no background in historical thinking skills, kung wala. Yung kung paano sila, like the two said, kung how they were taught, ganun sila nagtuturo. So it's a, like a completely different. Endless cycle, yeah. Things. Yeah, it's a different way. Yeah, okay, Think so. You, you proceed from the, because I'm a historian, so that's how I, although 
I can, uh, my, my undergrad was education, ha? pero MA, PhD, wala na, history na po. So, then, that's, it's really lack of knowledge, maybe. Okay, so, uh, related po dun sa, uh, sa topic natin ngayon, which is the competency of uh, social studies teachers. So, uh, a question from Amy Dison. You have mentioned about teachers teaching history without a solid background of history or even a profound training in history. Is this not the root problem, root of problems that we have in relation with teaching history? We cannot demand our students to think as historians since teachers who taught the subjects, the subject are not history experts themselves. So what will then be your suggestions on this matter? I think number one is the CPD training that the, the, the project is proposing. The, the real, yeah, that's a short term. Yeah. But the real solution is to reform teacher education sa Araling Panlipunan. Ano eh, tinignan ko na yung mga memo ng CHED tungkol dito. Ano eh, ewan ko lang ah, kung ako ang itatanong talagang hindi, hindi may misunderstanding ng some conceptual terms at may flaw eh, mali. Doon dapat, if we really want to give this a future, no, yung in-service training makakatulong para sa mga teachers na nasa service na. No? Pero in the future, yung reform ng teacher ed sa Araling Panlipunan, yun ang importante. I'll give you an example. Literacy. Everybody thinks, oh, lit literacy, uh, that, that is um, a, a generalized skill. But in history, historical literacy is different from just ordinary literacy. Ordinary literacy, you read something and then you ask, typical, no? Uh, uh, ano yung sinabi? nang may akda o gum gumawa ng buod sa tatlo, dalawa o tatlong pangungusap kung ano ang sinabi, ganyan, ganyan. So, you, in history, we don't start with ano yung sinabi. We ask, sino yung sumulat nito? Bakit kaya niya ni sinulat? Ano yung nangyayari nung panahong yon Like si, si Father Plasencia, yung pinakita ko, ba bakit niya? Bakit siya gumawa ng ganong narrative? No? Para kanino kaya niya sinulat yung istoryang yon? So before we even look at the content, it, it, it's, it's different. That's why, who is that, uh, Lorena, who says, I forget, look at me, I make, I make you all read. But history, uh, historical thinking is an unnatural act. Uh, Sam Weinberg. Sam Weinberg, yeah. Sam Weinberg. Unnatural act. Because it goes against the grain. Your normal tendency is, you know, to say, oh, what did he say? Oh, kwento mo naman. But in history, no. You know, like, ordinary literacy, you get the, if you still know what a telephone directory is, you open it, you get the name, you get the telephone number. History, no. Alamin mo muna, sino yung gumawa nito? And then later, you evaluate, kapanipaniwala ba yung sinasabi niya? Bakit kaya? Meron pang ibang nagsabi ng ganito rin or what? So, there's a process. It's a different kind of, 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 of literacy. And, and it's very useful in today's age because ang daming mga fake news. Like if you are trained in, to look at evidence, hindi ka, da, hindi ka basta basta madadala. O kasi sinabi, teka muna, saan ba nang galing yan? Ako, hindi, anong basehan yan? Ah, hindi, hindi, hindi ko tatanggapin yan, ganyan. It, it, it can apply not just to history, but to every facet of, of human life, even to making decisions, political decisions, collective decisions, decisions in the school, because you, you have to look at a broader picture than just the narrow thing before you. Um, sayang eh. There are so many ways and exciting ways to teach it, and I've seen it, kahit bata pa lang, tinuturo na eh sa ibang... Abroad, ako ay kaya. Kaya, nahihinayang ako. Ma Mauutak naman ang Pilipino. Bakit hindi natin ituro din? Ano? Well, yes, okay. Thank you po din, ma'am. So, an another question. I think we have four or five more questions uh, that we can entertain. Uh, next question from uh, Agnes Narag of Don Bosco, uh, Mandaluyo. How do you buy, uh, balance bias towards critical topics in social studies? What should be the approach when we have Con conflicting views with students. Since our students come from various backgrounds, how do we deal with, for example, cognitive dissonance? I love debate. I love it. It's the most exciting thing. You know, I saw 
Ewan ko alin lesson plan ba yun. Naalala ba nyo yung lesson plan na nandun nabasa natin sa teacher's manual? Parang, ewan ko kung dito ba yun, na parang pinipilit niya na yung sagot ng estudyante dapat umangkop o kumasya sa na iniisip ng teacher. No, I, I think what's important is we have to train the kids how to come to a conclusion. They cannot just say, like, uh, why do I like? Eh, ano, ma'am, type ko. Ayun ako, wala yung type-type. Bakit mo type? You know, you don't stop your bucket, bucket. You have to come up with a, a reasonable explanation. Oh, and saan mo nakuha yan? Yung information mo, et cetera, et cetera. Until you, you find out. If you still don't agree, then you... You don't agree, but what is important is that the student is able to think things out, is able to evaluate the information on which he or she bases his or her opinion and can defend it. Now, if the student clearly misrepresents the information, then you call it out. Oh, no, 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 binasa ko That's not what the source says. Ito yung sinasa, ganyan, ganyan. No? So, importante yon. But um, these are... You know, history people think it's boring because it's about dead people. But it's actually <laughs> exciting because we, we debate about it. We, 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 we question and we, we don't always agree with one another. Like historians, we don't always agree. But, but if I see that there is evidence, you have thought it out logically, your method of analysis is clear, Kahit na I do not agree entirely with your conclusion, you know, you, you make sense in the sense of the way you argue things out. Now, as a teacher, you probe, you ask questions. Have you thought about this? What about this? What about that? Then the student will say, ay, oo, oh, ma'am, di ko pa yan naisip. Ay, oo oh, nga pala, ma'am. O oh, sige, sige, erase, erase. Balik tayo, ma'am, erase, erase. O oh, ano ngayon? So the opinions are not are not written on stone when students are exposed to better ways of thinking and to more accurate and reliable information we have to guide them teach them how to come to a a conclusion uh, and what we call informed conclusion grounded in in evidence no? um, okay, thank you po dun, Mary. so an another one i think uh, uh related po dun sa pinag -uusapan. so uh, an anonymous attendee asked, based from your study, Philippine history requires a degree of content uh, expertise if we are to improve history education in the elementary level. Is, is the study implying that we should radically improve teacher qualification and or professional development to be a Philippine history teacher in elementary level? If so, what adjustments should be made with PRC vis-a-vis -vis a LEP okay, for elementary education degree holder? So, uh, matter of ano na po ito, medyo policy making, policy yeah. level. Long term na po. <laughs> ito uh -oh. na po yung susunod na lifetime. <laughs> uh -oh. So, okay, so. Pero, ay, sige po. Um, siguro one, I could give an insight siguro um, as to what we've been doing in the UP College of Education. Not to toot our own horns, pero halimbawa, no, um, in terms of um, revising the curriculum for P-Service, um, social studies teachers. So yung dalawa naming programa, yung Bachelor of Elementary Education for Social Studies and um, Bachelor of Secondary Education, no? um, we recently revised it. And if kung mapapansin ninyo, um, one of the revisions there is to um, insert more courses or add more courses wherein students are exposed to the discipline of history and they are given opportunity to do historiography. Halimbawa yung klase ni Sir Kirby, yung kaste, no, no? yun yung klase ng mga social studies majors. So sana um, in the long run, no, hopefully um, you other um, SUCs maybe, other private um, universities and colleges would also adapt, adopt uh, the same kind of approach in such a way wherein content and disciplinary tools no, are learned from courses that specialize 
in those disciplines. So, halimbawa, pagdating sa um, historiography, hindi kami ang nagtuturo. No? Hindi UP College of Education ang nagtuturo. Sino ang nagtuturo? Ang Departamento ng Kasaysayan. Because we acknowledge no, that they are the specialists when it comes to doing historiography. We're not in the position to um, adequately e- equip our students, no, our college students, with um, enough knowledge when it comes to historiography. So perhaps that could be one avenue to explore in the future no, in terms of reforming pre-service teacher training. Okay po. So, uh, salamat, uh, Professor Shari. I think uh, there are a lot of questions from our Zoom uh, chat box and from our Facebook pages. So, uh, but uh, uh, we cannot uh, entertain uh, all of them. So, uh, para tapusin yung ating uh, webinar. So, last question from Attorney Gianna. Uh, do you feel that knowing one's history contributes to a person being more nationalistic or more loyal to one's country? So, I think uh, to just to uh, bridge uh, yung uh, paksa na ating webinar which is on uh, teacher uh, competency on teaching history eh, or social studies in elementary to the topic of our webinar na uh, uh, on on how do we use uh, history as a uh, uh, for for nationalism or for for uh, reassessing our our meanings of nationalism so yun po. so okay so do you feel that knowing one's history contributes to a person's persons being more nationalistic or more loyal to one's country. Shall I take this up, ladies? Yeah, yes. For being okay. Um, Yana, I don't know if there's a correlation. What I do know is that most dictators have a very, very strong sense of history. Because uh, they, they, history is a, a ready tool that, that they can use to to advance their own agenda. And that's, that's happened time and time again. The most recent example is the one in the US, the siege of the Capitol when uh, uh, Ted Cruz, Senator Cruz was talking about the 1776 um, event in the, in the US. And he says, oh, he, he, was, he, was, he, he was harking back to that. Of course, he twisted it. But anyway, they, 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 people who have authoritarian tendencies, they, they like history. Uh, I mean, most dictators have that strong sense because they they also want to be remembered in, in, in history. Um, maybe well, let's put it this way: it's hard to it's hard to like yourself if you don't know yourself. So, in that regard, to to like yourself, to have a sense of integrity, to have a sense of loyalty to yourself, you have to know who you are. And this applies to us as a nation. And that's what social studies can, can offer. But does it automatically make you nationalistic? No, because there are too many other variables that mm-hmm. come to play. Is history useful? Yes. I'll give you a modern example. Uh, Justice Tapio, how he used the 1743 uh, Murillo uh, map. Okay. Um, you, you remember that in the Treaty of Paris, the Philippines was ceded to, to the U.S. by Spain, diba? for 20 million based on that 1743 map. But unfortunately, in the treaty, there were parts of the Philippine territory in the 1743 map that were not indicated in the treaty. So the Chinese said, oh, well, see, you're using the Treaty of Paris, according to the Treaty of Paris, therefore, uh, there's a line dash line, everything there beyond it, that's ours because it's not included. Thankfully, there, that Treaty of Paris was followed by a Washington Treaty two years later, which corrected it and said, the US said, everything, uh, and Spain, no, that, that everything that was in that map, um, which included the Philippines, but was not mentioned in the, we are included as if they were already there. So the map became very important. And what was in that map? So this is a case of, of of where going back to our our history becomes useful when you want to make even foreign policy, you want to make uh, official policy, it it can help. Actually, nowadays I've never seen history more used publicly than than ever before, because it is useful in so many in so many many ways. 
okay? But I would hesitate to say you, if you know history, you become more, more nationalistic. I don't know because what makes a nationalist? Sometimes it's not just knowledge of history, it's um, courage. So, ma'am, related dun sa, uh, sa idea ng nationalism. So, last, last question. So, how do we bridge historical knowledge with a lifelong commitment to civic action? So, so I think that's the last uh, in our deck. So, I think in addition to gaining content knowledge, um, developing the different thinking skills drawn from the social sciences, like um, history is key in shaping future responsible and well-informed and engaged citizens. No, um, After all, I forgot who said this, but um, an educated citizenry is the foundation of a well-functioning democratic government. So um, it's crucial that we sufficiently develop um, these higher order thinking skills. Ani mga halimbawa ng mga skills na to that would be useful no? um, for you to be a well-informed and engaged citizen. Halimbawa, yung simpleng pag-analyze na lang ng source. No? Determining which is a, uh, discerning which is a primary source and um, a secondary source. Um, yung ganyang skill is actually is actually um, absent siguro or um I guess, to an extent, no, online, halimbawa, yung pag-share na lang natin ng information online without determining kung reliable ba yung information na yan. That's actually a skill that historians use in um, determining the credibility and reliability of their sources. So, um, the way that we would, the, the skills actually that historians use are very useful and relevant um, in terms of our functioning as a citizenry. Another account, another example, halimbawa, yung taking on multiple perspectives, um, which I think is um, marami ring, um, hindi yun ginagawa, no? Uh, makikita na lang on how they respond to different social media posts, no? They fail to take into account ano kaya yung iniisip ng taong uh, nasa panahon na yun, no? So, nawawala yung ganong type of um, exercise or skill. So, um, be, being able to develop these um, skills, the skills that historians use in their discipline would actually be very helpful in developing a mature citizen. Career. So, thank you. Shall, Lorena, ikaw, or shall I ikaw muna and then I'll close? May, mahirap yung tanong, no? Parang, how do you bridge knowledge and practice, right? Parang, paano mo masigurado na yung alam niya ay eh, isinasabuhay niya? That's, that's very difficult because it's a matter of conviction. So, <laughs> maybe it's a matter of, ano ba, advocacy, constant reminder, baka ganun. Um, really because it's, it's so difficult na yung sinasabi mo na ito ay magta-translate to civic action. Well, the, the, the way I would put it is this. Huh? There, is a, there, there is a natural link, I would say, or a, maybe a logical link, I don't know what's the correct adjective, between historical knowledge and civic action in this sense. History is, a, is the study of a collective. It's not the study of me. It's a study of a group, of a people, of a society, a community. So when you are steeped in historical knowledge, you are not... You, you are steeped in the knowledge of a collective, of a group. You, 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 you try and understand you know, what went right, but you also learn about what went wrong. And those, those learnings are valuable. Uh, of course, that was in a time past, but it's valuable knowledge because it helps you understand the nature of a collective. See, as a society, natin, matingkad lagi yung sarili at sariling pamilya. Pag sabihin ko ako, kasama na doon yung pamilya ko. Pero pag not necessarily kasama doon yung bayan o yung komunidad o yung mas malawak na lipunan. Ang unang nasa isip ko lagi, ako, pamilya ko. Pero sa kasaysayan, hindi ganun ang pag-iisip. Ang natural na orientasyon uh, sa kasaysayan ay hindi yung sarili. Ang natural na orientasyon ay yung lipunan, yung komunidad yung bayan, yung sambayanan. Ganun ang kasaysayan. You don't study the history only of a person because a person doesn't live in a vacuum. 
a person lives in a society, in a particular historical field, time, place, space, all of that coming together. So in that sense, there is a, there is a, a given connection between historical knowledge and, and civic action. Uh, because you do not study yourself, you study a group, you study a collective, whether that's the Philippines, your community, your province, Asia, or what. You study a, a group. The, um, the second connection comes from the idea that historical knowledge helps you develop your identity. Because really, you, you, how do you know yourself? In an individually, you know yourself because you, you, you experience things. Sa iyong karanasan, sa araw-araw ng karanasan, sa iyong pakipag-ugnay, hindi lamang sa pamilya, kundi sa ibang mga tao sa labas ng pamilya, sa school, sa, sa trabaho, kung saan-saan. No? But in history, um, you, how, how, do you, how do you know history? We cannot experience it because we weren't alive uh, at that time. So we have to, we have to, we have to learn it um, by, by, by studying what, what uh, what happened, but we need to study what happened because how, that's the only way we can understand ourselves as a as a people. We because in normal life you say I, I develop my identity through my experience, but in history we don't experience. We were not alive when these things happened, but when we study them, then we develop an understanding of okay, so that's that that's what we are. That's why when I was telling when I make my my students even read about you know what the friars would say about our how how strange uh, beliefs or superstitions or actions that we would make and sometimes the kids laugh because they say mom hanggang ngayon that's one way of understanding who we are and identity is um, it's a necessary element of, of civic engagement it's very hard to engage in something that that you you don't know that's why if you look at the Araling Panipunan curriculum, instead of ending with a repeat of Philippine history in high school, it concludes with a year-long study of, of a contemporary issue or a contemporary concern. The idea being that you employ all the learnings and competency you've acquired from kindergarten until grade 11, sorry, grade 10, 9, or grade 10, because in grade 10, you have to do a research on a contemporary problem, whether it's mining in your, in your province or, or environment or this pandemic or corruption or whatever, maldistribution of what market goods. And, but, but you, you, that's what the grade 10 is supposed to be. Like, that's the parang, dun mo ipapakita yung kakayahan mong maging ma, ma, masuri, maunawan ng isang kontemporary problema and how you would engage in it. It's not just analyzing, but what you might be able to do, what you, what you, you, you can do. So, um, there is, there is a, I think there is a connection. The, the burden is really on, on us teachers to to push that bridge to to create to create that bridge by the questions we ask kaya maganda rin ang essay question eh. kasi yung alim elemento ng civic action civic engagement hindi mo makukuha sa multiple choice tama o mali fill in the blanks hindi mo ma, hindi mo makukuha doon eh or maybe kailangan kung hindi essay question isang gawain, kolektibong gawain ng klase o ng pangkat no? na nakatutok sa isang concern or problema, baka doon pwede. Nako, we have, uh, we have um, how do you say, tested everybody's yeah. patience, no? How many yeah. hours? <laughs> uh, so uh, after this webinar, ma'am, okay kitang-kita na yung gargantuan task. Okay, so I think uh, most of the people in our seminars are excited with our, with the soon-to-be okay, CPD training workshops. Okay, and there are still a dozen of questions and comments. Uh, uh, we apologize, we cannot accommodate uh, all of them, but uh, uh, we'll take note of your questions. And if you still have questions, you can send an email to the FEU Public Policy Center uh, and uh, so that uh, we can... Uh, we can uh, uh, take note of your questions and we can include that uh, in, in, in uh, our uh, uh, 
future endeavors. Okay, so and uh, uh, to end our program, may we invite uh, the director of the FEU, executive director of the FEU Public Policy Center, uh, Ms. Julia Andrea Arabad, to give the closing remarks. Thanks, um, Kirby, uh, and thanks to everybody for all your spirited participation in this long but super enlightening um, discussion. Informed and active citizenship is rooted in the effective teaching of a nation's history. More than memorizing milestones and important historical events, understanding how these events unfolded, and being able to see and understand the relationship between these events is critical to developing an ability to learn from one's past and to building a collective identity based on an accurate and shared understanding of the nation's past. The role that social studies teachers play in achieving these goals cannot be emphasized enough. We thank Maris and her team for the work they have put into analyzing the way history is being taught at present. But more importantly, we thank them in advance for the work that they are about to embark, embark on um, to train teachers towards more effective methods of imparting history and its lessons to our young people so that they may be better equipped to participate in the public life of our country and to make informed decisions related to social and political issues of importance. We at FPPC look forward to working with FEU Academy and the FEU Institute of Education and Maris's team to make this all happen. And we look forward to seeing all of you in our future workshops. So thank you again to all of you for the spirited discussion and for choosing to spend a large part of your afternoon with us. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Aban. And uh, some uh, couple of announcements. Again, if you have questions, uh, you can send us. Uh, uh, you can send them uh, sa email, official email ng FEO Public Policy Center. And uh, for those of you who need a uh, certificate of appearance, please fill out the form found in this link. Okay, nakikita niyo po sa ating uh, screen. So kindly. Fill out the form and uh, the FEU Public Policy Center will contact you once your certificates are available. Okay. Muli, maraming maraming salamat po sa pagdalo at pakikibahagi sa webinar na ito. And I hope uh, we can uh, all, uh, all meet soon okay, sa mga future activities okay, uh, organized by the FEU Public Policy Center. Muli po, maraming maraming salamat and uh, dito na po nagtatapos ang ating programa ngayong hapon. Salamat.